It's the full story of life crushed into four minutes. The entirety of humanity in the palm of your hand crushed into one sentence. Listen, it's intense, right? God, our sins, paying everyone life. The greatest story ever told that's hardly ever told, God. Yes, God, the maker and giver of life. And by life, I mean any and all manner and substance, seen and unseen, what can and can be touched, thoughts, image, emotions, love, atoms, and oceans, God. All of it is handiwork, one of which is a masterpiece, made so uniquely that angels look curiously. The one thing in creation that was made with his imagery, the concept, so cold. It's the reason I stay bold, how God breathed in a man and he became a living soul. Formed with the intent of being infinitely, intimately fond. Creator and creation held an eternal bond. And it was placed in perfect paradise till something went wrong. A species got deceived and started lusting for his job. An odd list of complaints as if the system ain't working. And used that same breath he graciously gave us to curse him. And that sin seed spread through our soul's genome. And by nature of your nature, your species, you participated in the mutiny. Our, yes, our sins. It's nature inherited, black in the human heart. It was over before it started. Deceived from day one and led away by our own lust. There's not a religion in the world that doesn't agree that something's wrong with us. The question is, what is it? And how do we fix it? Are we eternally separated from a God that may or may not have existed? But that's another subject. Let's keep grinding. Besides trying to prove God is like defending a lion, homie. It don't need your help. Just unlock the cage. Let's move on on how our debt can be paid. Short and sweet. The problem is sin. Yes, sin. It's a cancer. An asthma, choking out our life force, forcing separation from a perfect and holy God. And the only way to get back is to get back to perfection, but silly us. Trying to pass the course of life without referring to a syllabus. This is us. Keep up your good deeds. Chant, pray, meditate. But all of that, of course, is spraying cologne on a corpse. Or you could choose to ignore it as if something don't stink. It's like stepping in dog poop and refusing to wipe your shoe, but all of that ends with how good is good enough. Take your silly list of good deeds and line them up against perfection, good luck. That's life past your pay grade. The cost of your soul, you ain't got a big enough piggy bank, but you could give it a shot. But I suggest you throw away the list, cause even your good acts are an extension of your selfishness. But here's where it gets interesting. I hope you're closely listening. Please don't get it twisted. It's what makes our faith unique. Here's what God says as part A of the gospel. You can't fix yourself. Quit trying, it's impossible. Sin brings death. Give God his breath back, you owe him. Eternally separated, and the only way to fix it is someone die in your place, and that someone gotta be perfect, or the payment ain't permanent. So if and when you find a perfect person, get him or her to willingly trade their perfection for your sin and death in. Clearly, since the only one that can meet God's criteria is God, God sent himself as Jesus to pay the cost for us. His righteousness. His death functions as payment. Yes, payment. Wrote a check with his life, but at the resurrection, we all cheered, cause that means the check cleared. Pierced feet, pierced hands, blood-stained son of man. Fullness, forgiveness, free passage into the promised land. That same breath that God breathed into us, God gave up to redeem us. And anyone and everyone, and by everyone, I mean everyone who puts their faith and trust in Him, and Him alone can stand in full confidence of God's forgiveness. And here's what the promise is, that you are guaranteed full access to return to perfect unity by simply believing in Christ and Christ alone. You are receiving life. Yes, life. This is the gospel. God, our sin.
I've seen that video probably over 100 times now. And every time I see it, chills up the back, um, tears in my eyes, because of how true what he is saying. And the fact that the message that we see, see in that, we need to experience in our daily lives. I'm trying something new this week. So if I'm a little antsy, bear with me. Um, we see this platform up here. I'm going to make a quick joke. This platform was put here after I preached last. Jane made a comment last time I preached. I had to move the camera around quite a bit when you preach. So they put this here, and I'm even restraining myself even more and putting, putting myself on this stool. And so if I'm a little shaky today, it's because of that. Um, but I want to start off with uh, an illustration to go into my message. Uh, growing up, I loved Lego. Um, it was my favorite thing to play with. Um, I had two like massive Tupperware uh, or Rubbermaid containers of Lego. And I remember building and building and building. And if you're an older brother or younger brother, and, or you have either, you know what happens next. Someone comes along, if you build a tower or build a building, it goes like this. I had two older brothers and a little sister. Towers didn't last long in my house. And then I had to, it had to be rebuilt. And sometimes that rebuilding made it better. And the rebuilding made it so that they could come push it over. And I n learned from the last time. And it was stronger when it got knocked over. It didn't fall. Well, it fell, but it didn't break. And so today we're going to look a little bit at that. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to move on. Father, I'd like to come before you and thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you that we could come together, meet with you, sing songs, and hear a message from your word. Use me right now. Calm my heart. Uh, give me the words that you want to share today. If there are words that come out of my mouth that are not supposed to be said, uh, block them from reaching people's ears. Let us have open hearts and open ears to hear what the message you have for us today. I'd like to pray this in your name. Amen. So this is a message that I need to hear even. Oh, Bibles. Does anyone need a Bible? If you don't have one, put your hand up. We will get you a Bible. Still getting used to that one from up here. Anyone need one? Um... Uh, Looks like we're good this week. So God, through the Holy Spirit, wants to rebuild us, and he wants to breathe his life into us. Like the guy said on the video, in creation, God made us in his image, but we weren't alive until we had his breath. And then at Pentecost, the church didn't come fully alive until the Holy Spirit came, and the wind came through the room. And all of a sudden, there was tongues and healings and everything, and the church went out. God's breath came into them. So I'd like you guys to turn to Ezekiel. It's after Lamentations, before Daniel in the Bible. And we are going to turn to uh, Ezekiel 37. Um, this is the passage of the Valley of Dry Bones. God has taken um, Ezekiel, the prophet uh, of, of that time, and put him... Um, give, has given him this vision, and uh, this is uh, what God has said uh, in this passage. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out, of this, out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the valley, in, in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them. And behold, there was a very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered him, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, and as I commanded, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling 
and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and then flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied, and as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. This passage um, causes me great uh, difficult sometimes, that bone to bone, like these things were dead. They were dry. Dry bones doesn't mean dead for a year. Dry bones mean deads for like century. And so the, here's these bones. And I was trying to find someone who was a hunter and get like deer antlers and rattle them together so you get the effect of when uh, Ezekiel prophesied and bones came together. But they were, the nation, this picture of the valley of dry bones is the nation of Israel. And they were dead. They were in um, exile at this time. And so they were not in, in their land. They had a foreign king over top of them. And so the nation, by all standards of that day, was dead. They had their own religion still. They called themselves the people of God and Israelites. But the nation was dead. It was broken. And then God speaks and says, come together. And he starts rebuilding these uh, dry bones. And sinews, little things to hold us together. I don't know biology very well, but from what I take, we need those things. And then flesh, and flesh is meat. It, it, it's our muscles. The muscles are coming back. And then flesh. And this goes right back to creation, where God says, take some dust, goes like this. I'm doing it because that's how I take it. God just took some dust and goes like this. All of a sudden, there's like Adam. How I picture it, you can picture it the way you want. It doesn't say in the Bible how he does it. But he rebuilt the bones, and he, he, he made a person come back. And they look alive. It, it, on TV shows, there's people who um, play very good roles of lying like dead people. For all we know, they, they look very much alive. All thing, the only reason we know that they're dead is because they're a little paler because of makeup, and they're not moving, and the actors tell us they're dead around them. And so we don't... So there, there's people who um, look like... <laughs> yeah, I want to stand up and move. Um, there's people who look like they're alive and have everything they need to live. They have the muscle, they have... Um, the sinews, they have skin. Um, so everything's there, but they're not living. Those people are good for nothing. Yep, good for nothing. They sit there, look pretty, but what do they do? They sit there. And for those who have ever been in a cast or who have ever had surgery and couldn't move something for a long time, um, there's something called muscle atrophy. And this is the muscle dying. And over time, you can't regain that muscle. So these people look alive, doing nothing. They're dying again. They're not doing anything. And then Ezekiel is told to breathe the life, or to ask the breath to come into them. And in verse 10, it says, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. They lived. And not just a small life, they lived. They were a great army. Um, this takes my mind right back to Ephesians 6, um, 10 to the, uh, almost to the end of the chapter. Um, it's, a, it's a verse that's very close to my heart, um, or passage, I should say. Um, Paul's 
talking about the armor of God. Um, so I'm just going to quickly read it for you because I, it just means so much. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, or withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains, that I might may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And this is Paul. Um, and, a gr- and Paul's talking about spiritual warfare. And this is where I want to transition to. Because what's a good sermon if you don't take anything from it? I can explain this passage. I've done it rather quickly. Dry bones. We are dead. Rebuilding. God heals us in all forms. Whether it's emotionally, physically, spiritually, or any other way that you can be healed. And rebuilt. God will do that. But what good is it if that's all you get? That, oh, he explained the passage. So I had a professor in college, and the so what's for each verse, and it was my, in my first year Acts class, every uh, chapter he had so what's. So what? What do we learn from this chapter? So, so what about this? Dry bones. Are you feeling dead? Have, are you feeling beat down, tired, have no strength? Are you far away from God? There are some people who might be in this room who have no experience with God, who are very far from God and are in pieces and in shambles and are dead spiritually. We have to get to the point for those people, this is the so what, the rebuilding stage. We have to be rebuilt. Each of us has our sin. Each of us has fallen. And we need to be rebuilt. We need Christ's blood, his payment for us to come back and heal us and take everything away. And so God works on us. He rebuilds us. And for some people, that looks different. For me, it was dealing with a lot of my anger issues when I became a Christian. And that was one of the areas. And it was, it had to be chipped away from me. And so sometimes rebuilding, um, healing hurts. And this is a stage where we become Christians. When God is healing us, we give our faith to Christ. We put Christ as our Lord. Uh, In Romans it says, um, if you confess Christ as Lord, he will forgive you your sins. It's not say, confess Christ as Savior. It's Lord. Um, and that has something. And um, last week, that's one of the things I took uh, from Matt Tapley, the main speaker, is he hammered that point home in one of his uh, uh, sermons, is Lord. There's a difference between Lord and Savior. The Lord is, like the guy said in the video, give your breath back. And so God is going to continue to rebuild us. And then then we get to where we are filled with the Holy Spirit, where the breath comes into us. And this is, this is something that changes us. The Holy Spirit comes in. He indwells us. And for those who have had a really strong encounter with the Holy Spirit, 
Sometimes you'll fall on your knees. Sometimes you will cry. Sometimes you will get so bold that you will run out of your house, go to a Tim Hortons, and talk to some stranger you've never met. I have friends who do that. They just, the Holy Spirit's going to grasp you. And if you have the breath of life, if you have the Holy Spirit within you, this is what we need. So he rebuilt us, and we can look good, but it means nothing if we don't have the Spirit. We can look good. We can have the facade that we are Christians. But if we are not doing the things that Christ commanded us, if we are not living for Christ, we get muscle atrophy in our spiritual walk. And there's only one way that we can be healed. And I've seen it sometimes where muscle atrophy actually means losing a limb. But this is what we need. We need to be filled with the Spirit. And if we are filled with the Spirit, um, John 14, 12, uh, if you turn there to read it, will be true. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will do also do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. This is a great verse. We are told we're going to do greater things than Christ did on this earth. And what did Christ do? Christ fed 5,000 people. Christ healed people. Christ preached. Christ had a glorified meeting with Moses and Elijah. Those are some awesome things. And so when the Spirit comes upon us, there are many things we can do. We can heal people. We can teach, we can preach, we can pray, we can sing. We can do so many things. And everything is a movement of the Spirit. And in um, John 14, uh, verse 15, uh, this is something that I, I absolutely love. Um, it's something that God um, says to me over and over again. And it's also back in... Um, Deuteronomy, um, but this is uh, Christ speaking. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. This is something that Christ tells us. If you love Christ... If you submit to him as Lord, you're going to keep his commandments. There's devotion when you submit to Christ, when the Holy Spirit comes within you. There is something that changes with inside of you. It's not like you're going to all of a sudden become richer, more famous, healthier, all those things. There's a section out there in the church called Health and Wealth, Prosperity Gospel. I don't agree with it. But there are things we can do when we get filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the thing. I want to keep hitting home. We can heal people. We can teach them. We can pray. We can worship. We can lead. We can bring people to Christ and a fuller knowledge of Christ. This is the thing. Matthew 28. Go into the world and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say go and make converts. It says go and make disciples. We need to get people deeper. We need to get people to the point where the Holy Spirit comes into them and they're moving. And it won't be us doing the work. It'll be God. It'll be the Holy Spirit moving us. So if we flip back to um, Ezekiel, I'm going to finish up the chapter. Because there's a promise here. 11 to, uh, well, not the end of the chapter, to 14. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore, therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves, 
and that raised you from the graves. O my people, I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when, you op- when I open your graves and raise you from your graves. O my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. Awesome. We're not Israel. I, at least I'm not. I'm not part of um, that, that nation at least by bloodline. We are grafted in as Christians to Israel. This promise that God makes right here, that he will raise us up from our graves, that he will put us in the promised land, which is Israel, is a promise we can grasp today. There's a controversial um, author out there named Rob Bell. I don't agree with 97% of what he says, but in the four books of his that I've read, In each book, he makes it very clear he wants people to live out their salvation now. And that struck me. In every book, he says it. In every book that he writes. So, for me, I throw everything else he he writes. I I don't agree with it. It, it. It scares me, some of it. But, when he says, live out your salvation now, live it out. Don't wait till you die. Don't wait till you're older. Your salvation matters now. The fact that Christ saved you, the fact that Christ died on the cross, and that he's going to open your grave, he's going to heal you, he's going, he wants to give you your spirit, or his spirit. He wants you to be full. He wants you to be back in that perfection with that intimate bond with him. Creation is a perfect story of where we're supposed to be. Walking next to next with um, hand to hand, face to face communication with God. It's not something far off. We can have that. We can have intimate relationships with God. We can have our closest friend in God. So, God gave us this promise the fact that He's going to open our graves and place us back into a promised land. But we have to, within that, accept the Holy Spirit coming. We have to be indwelt. We have to live in the Spirit. And that means doing the things that Jesus commands. So, as I close my sermon, God gave us a promise. He wants to to see us become a great army of God. And for that to happen, we need to let him rebuild us. We need to let him save us. And we need to let him fill us. And that's a challenge this week. Are you going to let God do those things in your life? Are you going to let God fill you with the Holy Spirit and transform you into an elite fighting machine in the spiritual war? Thank you.